All right, here we are in the morning of uh, December 3rd, turn 11. Uh, the only thing in the early phases, uh, the random event, of course, is late rain. Uh, the Union reinforcements, they got one brigade. Thompson's uh, District of the Etowa U.S. Colored Troop Brigade. Uh, I think it's three manpower. Oh, sorry, five manpower. Um, and that's it. Uh, leader transfer. I can't remember if I did it this turn or not, but Hood is now with Stewart's Corps. Um, nobody else had moved around or anything. Um, so now we're going to go to the action cycle. And um, at the end of this, after the action cycle, is when we start doing the Union Cavalry phase and have to... Um, just figure out if the Union Cavalry is going to hold up or if they become like infantry. Uh, basically, the Union player is going to want to get his cavalry up here or somewhere up near Nashville uh, so that uh, they can get off board and get new mounts and then come on fresh. Otherwise, they have to keep rolling every turn and they might, like, they're. they're their horses might go lame, and they have to fight like cow, uh, fight like infantry. But anyway, that's all after the action phase. So I'll get into that now and bring you back if anything happens. All right, just an update: a couple of uh, rounds in here. So uh, Stewart's Corps uh, leapfrogged Lee's Corps and moved up. Um, Moore's brigade was here at one point, and so they had to stop where Walthall's division is um, because they entered the Zoc. Um, but then Schofield got an activation. He managed to get Moore out. He, he got a pretty good role for marching. Um, so he commanded Waters' brigade to take the wagon train. Oops. Yikes. Um, out of Franklin. Oh gosh, I'm really messing it up now. So the wagon trains went out of Franklin with Waters. Um, and left in Franklin was Force One now, so Hatch's Cavalry, um, most of Stanley's Four Corps, and the two divisions of Schofield's 23 Corps, um, with more outside the defenses and the 175th Ohio in the fort. Um, to the north of town on the uh, other side of the river. Then Stewart uh, moved up Loring's division. Loring's division is under this stack here. Uh, there. And now Lowe is going to do a cavalry retreat. So it's a minus two. So, well, if they roll a natural one, uh, they lose their last manpower. Anything else um, is how much uh, movement points is taken away from uh, Loring's March. They roll four minus uh, two because it's a small force is two. So uh, the Loring will have two movement points left over. Low gets a fatigue um, and becomes disorganized and retreats four to six hexes. He'll go north through Wilson's stack there I think and end up somewhere back here. Um, but I'll go ahead and do that off camera and bring you back later on. Here we are at the end of turn 11. Uh, it's December 3rd. So uh, we can finally see Nashville and the Confederates in one camera shot. Uh, and not really looking pretty with these wagon trains out here. Uh, Jackson got his cavalry uh, from way down here in Smyrna, up the pike and railroad, and was exerting a zock on the uh, Franklin Pike there. So Thomas sent out Thompson's brigade from the district of the Etowa, the Colored Corps, or Colored Troop, sorry. Um, and they might attack them next turn, we'll see. Um, but they don't have a leader, the District of the Etowa, so they're kind of just have to be moved individually. Um, over here, uh, it's just a cluster on the pike around Brentwood. 
it's kind of getting embarrassingly, uh, you know, disorganized. Uh, but in Franklin itself, I have to tell you, Hood was tempted to do a attack because uh, Cox's division and Ruger's division, you look up here at Force One, this is after the recovery phase, but before that, uh, they were all disorganized and exhausted, and it was really tempting to give it a shot, but there's a fort marker under there. If I see if I can do this gracefully. There's a fort marker under there, so they get times three manpower anyway, so even disorganized, they're still pretty powerful. And it would have been suicide, as uh, the historic Hood found out when he uh, assaulted Franklin. But we're going to try to conserve our manpower and do one final fling at Nashville. Um, and you see all these little fort markers outside Nashville. We have to take those before we move into them. So there's a lot we have to do still. We're going to have to have all of our uh, manpower. And we'll just be probably um, throwing lives away in front of Nashville, which is okay with Thomas. And then he can do his counterattack. Or maybe... Uh, Hood will be successful, who knows? Everything's possible still on December 3rd into the 4th until it's not, right? Um, the rain came and bogged everything down like usual. So not much happened on the cavalry front on to the east or towards Murfreesboro. Oops, got knocked off. Um, that's Milroy with his uh, defense of the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad um, command force two. I showed you that already, um, but that's a pretty strong force that cavalry isn't going to be able to take. Um, Steedman is just making his way up the what pike is this? The Murfreesboro Pike, trying to get to Nashville in time for the battle because he does have that's an eleven manpower division. So uh, we'll want to have that in Nashville. That might actually turn the tide. Uh, or not. Who knows? Anyway, that's the end of turn 11. Going into turn 12. Bring you back. Oh, and uh, for the cavalry phase, nobody, none of the Union cavalry is uh, unmounted. Uh, if we look over here, they're all, they all have worn out markers. But nobody, when you did the roll, it had to be a 6 except for low, he had a plus one modifier, but um, nobody rolled a six, so nobody is unmounted. Their horses are just a little tuckered out. Anyway, that's the end of this turn. I'll bring you back after the reinforcements and all and show you turn 12. All right, this one looked too different from before, but this is the start of turn 12. The random event is, of course, late rain. You guessed it. Um, the Union reinforcements, they got another division from the District of the Etowah, Miller's division, which is a manpower 11, so super chunky. Um, they now have quite a lot of manpower in Nashville. And I think Thomas is going to start posting his divisions out in these forts um, just to, you know, prepare for the Confederates. No need to bottle them up in Nashville when he's got all these guys. So Schofield and Stanley, I think uh, it can be said they did their job. They delayed long enough to allow um, Thomas to organize his defenses. Now all they have to do is try to get these wagon trains in there um, to, I guess, uh, for face-saving purposes maybe. I don't know, because, again, the um, victory points you get for destroyed wagon trains, not that much. But uh, it's a pride thing, I think. Um, and I, I think the Union would appreciate not having to burn their own wagon trains. Anyway, that's the uh, start of turn 12, December 4th. Um, so I'll bring you back if there's any battles or anything. Otherwise, we'll see you at the end of the turn. All right, as was sort of inevitable, um, Jackson brought Armstrong's brigade uh, on a march. To attack Wagon Train A, who is at half combat. Uh, well, excuse the mess. So it's at uh, half combat 
points or effectiveness or whatever on one manpower because it's disorganized. So um, that makes a, a ratio modifier of two to one because Armstrong is two combat. Uh, tactical modifier is another plus two because of Jackson's two. Uh, but this is a attack in a march and all they have movement points left for is a hasty attack. So minus one. So overall it's a plus two for the Confederates on this one. And that's well. I think the Union might have gotten lucky on this one. Uh, so three to three plus zero. We look at, let's see if I can do this. This is not going to be pretty. Okay, so um, show you this. So the Confederates had uh, two manpower or uh, combat value uh, plus zero. They are disorganized and fatigued. So nothing. And at half the um, wagon train is also just disorganized and fatigued. So nothing much happened with that. Uh, the wagon trains, the sutlers, I guess, found some rifles and were able to scare off the uh, Confederate cavalry. And maybe they thought that there was a bigger force there than there actually was. So uh, I'll go ahead and get that marked up and bring it back if there's anything else. In next activation, Hatch has decided he wants to try to be a hero. So he marched Coon's cavalry brigade up to the wagon train um, and is going to hasty attack Jackson and uh, this Armstrong, Armstrong's brigade. So the uh, ratio modifier is a plus one because Coon is a two, and now Jackson's disorganized at a one combat value. Um, the tactical modifier is even, but because it's hasty, it's minus one, so it's just a straight die roll between these two. And I'll even show you the roll this time. So six to four is a minus two on this attack. So on the attacker, he was a two, minus two, disorganized, and fatigued for uh, the defender, and that's just, uh, it's increased to one, but since uh, Armstrong is already at fatigue four, uh, it can't go any further. So, not a terrible result, not what the Union was looking for, but at least they didn't lose any manpower. I'm gonna go ahead and mark that up, and I'll bring you back um, if anything else happens. Here we are at the end of turn 12, December 4th. Um, so we'll start the Confederates, uh, Cheatham, it rained of course, so uh, not much moving. But uh, Cheatham split up his core. He took two divisions, Claiborne's and Brown's with him um, up Harpeth Pike. And he sent Bate, Bates' division uh, east and it's going to link up with Chalmers' cavalry division. Uh, here I guess a Triune and kind of go down to try to pin some Union forces down in Murfreesboro, maybe destroy a railroad to get some victory points, I don't know. But historically, Bates' division did go uh, further east. I think they interdicted riverine traffic, maybe on the Cumberland River. I can't, I can't remember, I have to look that up. Um, so sorry if that's wrong, but I know Bates' division did get detached from Cheatham's Corps. But, of course, that happened when they were already enveloping Nashville, which they haven't done yet uh, in this playthrough. Uh, Schofield was able to do... Oh, sorry. Just to finish, uh, the uh, Confederates did take control of Franklin after Schofield left. Um, so Lee's and Stewart's Corps uh, marched through Franklin and onto the Franklin Pike, much less bloody than the uh, real-life happenings. Um, Stanley brought his four core in good order up to Brentwood, which you can see right there. Um, and he has the wagon trains covered now, so the Confederates kind of lost their chance while there was a couple wagon trains out there. But um, basically, 
the Union have to get the wagon trains to Nashville by this turn because bringing up here instead of the turn track, we're at the end of turn 12. So they have turn 13, which is the last day of fall, I guess, because winter weather starts on turn 14. And they have to get the wagon trains to Nashville before then, which might be hard. Um, they'll probably have to push it, uh, risk some uh, extended marches, but um, I think they'll be able to do it once they push Jackson's cavalry off the pike, which uh, Stanley should be able to do with his four core. Um, so yeah, that's the situation at the end of this turn. Um, not much else is happening. Uh, oh, uh, Tom, uh, Thomas did rearrange his defenses a little bit. He brought out Miller's division and uh, Thompson's uh, brigade kind of retreated from its advanced position up here uh, near Flat Rock and Thompson's church and they retreated to uh, Fort Negley on the outskirts of Nashville. And Thomas's brigade uh, went east to cover down um, the Murfreesboro Pike. And these all count as manpower, so um, the Confederates can't just move in there. Um, but we're kind of staging ourselves for a counterattack once the Confederates end up on our doorstep. I think is how it's going to happen. Anyway, that's the end of this turn. I'll bring you back to show you the reinforcements and the plans for the next turn. So dawn breaks on the morning of December 5th, turn 13. Um, our random event was um, enhanced movement and the Union won the die roll so they get plus one on infantry marches and plus two on cavalry marches, uh, movement points that is. And the uh, Union got two reinforcements. They got Cooper's Brigade from 23 Corps, which came in on the river, and McCook with LaGrange, I believe, yeah, his Cavalry Brigade. And we just put them, um, so the Nashville entry areas are this hex, this hex, and then the two Nashville city hexes. So I just put him up on the uh, hex outside of uh, the city to kind of cover the flank because as you can kind of see, there's already quite a stack of Union units inside Nashville. And um, thinking about it now, I think uh, Hood is going to have to make an attack on Schofield's uh, divisions and armies now because if he doesn't do it now and they do get back to Nashville, then it's just, they're gonna be, the Union Army is just gonna be combined and too big. So while the odds aren't great here, they're even worse if they get to Nashville. So we're gonna see if we can bring up a good old hood-like grand assault. Um, and if not, then maybe, uh, well, we'll see. I'll bring you back when I get to that point. Um, so yeah. All right, I'm just gonna catch you up real quick. So um, Stuart and Lee's cores both got, um, in two activations in a row, they were able to get their cores up to Schofield, who was here at this blacksmith on the pike. Um, and Hood was hoping for the next activation so he could do a grand assault with these two cores. Uh, but Schofield unfortunately got the next uh, activation, so he was able to pull back and consolidate with Stanley, who is Force One. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Forrests um, brought Buford's cavalry division down and around on one activation. So um, I should clarify. So Forrest and Buford's uh, division are on. Holt Knob here, while Wilson and Croxton and Hammond's Brigades of Cavalry are on the Harpeth Pike uh, just north of them. So it's these two hexes that are under, um, we're looking at. I just split everybody up so you can see um, because Forrest is doing an assault on um, these two cavalry brigades. So um, with the modifiers, uh, 
It's a plus one for the assault, plus another one for forest leading the assault. The tactical mo modifier is a one because forest is a three and Wilson's a two. And those are the only modifiers uh, for this battle. Uh, Hammond and Croxton are both disorganized. So they are at one combat strength. So it's two in total for the Union, and then Crossland and Bell are three total manpower strength, so it's a one to one. So plus three on this die roll for the Confederates. And nope, that's not good. Uh, even with the three, uh, is only a plus one. A plus one for the attackers. They get disorganized. I'll put it up for you. Uh, they get disorganized at a plus one, and so do the defenders. So disorganization and fatigue is all that happens from this little cavalry skirmish. So nothing much going on there. Um, Forrest was hoping to clear the Harpeth Pike for Cheatham's uh, core to move up and catch um, Schofield kind of in the, in the side while uh, the other two corps marched down the... Uh, Franklin Pike, but it's not to be this time. Uh, so I'll get that cleaned up and bring you back if there's any other action. So a bit of a disaster on the Pike for the Union. Um, Stanley tried marching the wagon trains towards Nashville. Wagon train B is okay. They've passed their extended march checks, but Q taps because wagon trains A and C both lost their second manpower uh, because of the extended march. So I have dutifully charted the victory points for the Confederates. So now they're at 31 for the manpower loss and the uh, destroyed Union wagon trains. I think they only need about 120 for more victory points for a uh, some sort of a marginal victory or something. So that's the uh, drama on the pike. Schofield keeps getting away from... Uh, Hood, you see Lee and Cheatham's corps almost had Schofield when he was out at Brentwood. Brentwood got the, or sorry, Schofield got the next activation, is able to retreat a couple more hexes past north of Brentwood. Hood has brought Stewart's corps up uh, in contact with him, and he's going to try to bring up one of the other two corps um, to see if they can get some sort of grand assault going again before he runs out of fatigue. He's going to push it to four. Uh, right now, everybody's on two fatigue on the Confederate side. So he's going to push it to try to really get Schofield out and destroy some manpower uh, before we get to Nashville. So that's that. I'll bring you back if Hood's successful and can initiate a grand assault. All right. You might not believe me, but it looks like Hood is going to pull off a grand assault after all. So <clears throat> um, Stewart's Corps is leading the assault from this hex into Schofield uh, on the pike directly to the north of him. Um, I've already done some of the rolling because it takes me a while to figure out, but basically Stewart with his uh, command rating of six, he rolled a one. Um, so um, both divisions in his core and that hex are able to join the assault and that is Loring and French's divisions. Um, and then he brought in Hood with his Grand Assault to try to get Cheatham's two divisions into the fray. Hood rolled a two, um, which means he was able to bring basically this hex into the Grand Assault. Um, and that in Cheatham's division um, included Claiborne's, and, or sorry, Cheatham's core. Claiborne's division and Brown's division um, against Schofield's, uh, Cox's division and Ruger's division and the 175th uh, Ohio Regiment, which is still detached. Uh, so overall, that puts... Oops, sorry, I uh, knocked the uh, camera, but hopefully that's kind of in the same place and the magic in ed of editing will make it look like uh, nothing happened, but if it's slightly off, that's why my foot got excited. So, 
Back to it. Uh, the manpower then for this assault is 28 manpower for the Confederates to 20 on the uh, Union side. So there's no ratio modifier there. However, the Confederates get plus two for the flank bonus because they have five hexes covered around Schofield. They get plus one for the assault action and plus one for hood. So that's plus four and I don't think anything else uh, counts because the artillery modifier, uh, the Confederates have plus three difference, but that's a no effect. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's no other modifiers, so just plus four on the Confederate die roll. And let's see what happens. Oh, that's, that's uh, not good. Well, I mean, depending on what side you're on. So it's a 66 plus zero for these boys, and that's not going to be good. It's a 28 on the manpower chart. That's uh, put it in here, get it in the zoom or in focus. So 28 for the attacker. Three loses three manpower and becomes disorganized, and 20 for the defender they just become disorganized. So, Schofield was able to hold out. Um, yeah, that's, I think, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer for the uh, Confederates, but I think that might be the uh, Hood's campaign over. He wasn't able to inflict a single manpower loss on Schofield with two cores. Um, and he lost, I mean, it's actually kind of cool because it's almost a uh, redux of the Battle of Franklin, except that not in Franklin's outside of Brentwood. So slightly north of the historic battle, but Hood does his assault because he probably felt pressure to um, attack before they got back to Nashville and he paid the price and wasn't able to inflict any kind of devastating uh, losses on the Union. So I think, I don't know, I know some people play uh, these war games as like a game and, and so do I. I mean there is a game element to it and trying to win and beat the system but I, I, I do enjoy it a lot when um, these games, you play them kind of how you think they would be, the, like you, you try to play it optimally, you try to play it strategically and then you sort of get the same historical result um, it's enlightening. Just like in the beginning, it was enlightening to see how the Confederates uh, got the Union out of Columbia by maneuvering them on the Duck River. And here it was enlightening to see and to feel as the Confederate player the uh, pressure to make an attack before the uh, Union could get back to Nashville and consolidate their forces. So it's, and I, I mean, I wasn't trying to make a uh, historically correct campaign. I mean, if the Confederates won, I thought that would be interesting too. But it's also just as interesting to see um, the same result, the same historical result played out in the table um, as you're trying to just work with the pieces you have and the die rolls that you get. So anyway, yeah, so on the Confederate side, it's a disappointing result, but on the Union side, I think Nashville was saved at the Battle of Brentwood in this playthrough. So I'll get it cleaned up. Uh, I don't know how much, I mean, I'll probably play a few more turns just to actually get to Nashville and do uh, Thomas's counterattack. That'll be fun. Um, but yeah, I don't think we're going to do the whole 32 turns at this point because um, after Thomas's counterattack, it will just be the uh, Union chasing the Confederates back across the board. Anyway, who knows? I might do the whole thing. But for now, the Battle of Brentwood is concluded with three manpower losses for the uh, Confederates. Here we are at the start of turn 14, December 6th. So this was shaping up to be a a fun turn. So at the end of the last turn, um, I'm not sure if I showed you, but Lee uh, moved in to confront Schofield on this hex, um, and then 
Stanley from his Force One marker sent, uh, who did he send? Wagner's, I think, division uh, back to Schofield because Schofield is fatigue four, so marching them wasn't really in the cards that turn. So Stanley sent another division to bolster him in case uh, Lee decided to do an assault on the next activation. Um, and uh, so he was able to do that, balance out the odds a little bit. And then even though the Confederates did get the, uh, the next activation and could have assaulted with Lee, maybe they should have, but um, Hood thought we wait till the next turn and we do a grand assault and we see we have Chalmers uh, cavalry division up here. Uh, Walthall's a, f a fresh division. He was brought in from uh, his position west of Schofield. Um, and so Hood thought, wait till the next turn and we'll do a grand assault and get a lot more manpower onto Schofield and really um, pin him down and knock in and hopefully knock some uh, like uh, manpower out of him. So that was the plan, but of course the best laid plans don't really account for the weather, uh, especially in 1864. So after the recovery phase, the uh, cavalry phase for the Union, so a couple of um, cavalry units became dismounted because they were so exhausted, and so they're now like infantry. It's uh, Croxton's brigade and Johnson's brigade. Uh, I think this is Johnson maybe. Yeah, so this guy, can you see him? Uh, no, you can't. <laughs> I'll zoom out. Hold on. Okay, there we go. So, Knight down here with his uh, 7th Cavalry, I guess, division, but Johnson's Brigade, they're dismounted. And Croxton, who I believe is in one of these stacks up here. He might be uh, in Wilson's stack, I, I can't remember. And I'm not going to go fishing for him. Um, Okay, hold on to your pants, we're zooming back in. Okay, so um, so yeah, that was the plan. And then next turn comes in, and starting turn 14, you have to start rolling for winter weather. So I'm gonna show you the rule book. And so, I'm gonna have to zoom out. Okay, no, I'm not gonna have to zoom out again. So for the winter weather table, you have to roll one die, and on a three or less, no effect, four or more, and winter weather starts, and you see there's a modifier, minus two on the first turn you roll for it, December 6th, which is the term we're on. And um, so I rolled, and of course, uh, what does the Union player roll? A six. So winter weather starts, and really couldn't have come at a better time for the Union, because I'm going to read out winter weather's effects. So that it lasts for, I think, six or seven turns. Um, and so basically there's no entrenching. Uh, you can't burn railroads. Uh, each turn action cycle ends immediately. The first tide initiative die roll. So you, um, once, the, once both sides roll the same number on initiative die roll, the turn ends. Um, the units spend movement points and are hexes as if, it, as if it were a rain turn, so everything costs uh, like double basically to move anywhere. Um, you can't uh, select a unit to perform a march action either independently or part of an activate leader action if that action would increase the unit's fatigue from three to four. Um, in combat, the attacker has a special minus two combat modifier. Assaults are not allowed. And all we, you can Union wagon trains still in the map of the start of winter weather are immediately removed. Oh, so I didn't do that. So um, if there's any consolation for the Confederacy, it's that all three Union wagon trains were destroyed. Um, and Union player keeps on rolling for reinforcements, which I haven't done yet, but I should. So um, that's winter weather inbound. I guess it's snowing, getting pretty cold outside Nashville. Um, and I'm kind of debating whether to call it here. I mean, this is going to last for uh, until December 12th. Right now we're on December 6th. So it's a lot of turns of just not really doing anything. I mean, the only thing that's going to happen, because you can't assault, so the only thing you can do is um, 
attack on the march, which is just one unit, and um, Bates division, which is okay. I'm sorry, we're gonna we're gonna zoom out. All right, so Bates division uh, was sent east to try to burn some of these railroads and put pressure on Murphy's Bro, and then hopefully, because um, you get. Uh, what's it called? Victory points or burning railroad stations, but only um, I think manpower five or more you have to be to actually burn it and not just damage it. Anyway, so that's why I sent Bates down there. Um, but he's not going to be able to burn the railroad stations for the next seven turns or whatever. Uh, so that's uh, victory points lost. And I think all that's going to happen as the Union player, all I'm going to do is obviously move Stanley's and Schofield's cores into Nashville. And they're going to have plenty of turns to rest and refit, get reorganized, become unexhausted, um, all that good stuff. Well, okay, I mean, Hood will have the same opportunity. He can just pick a defensive position maybe on the east side of Mill Creek right here. This uh, minor river, it says. Um, he can get on the other side of those bridges, which is kind of what he did historically. I think historically he uh, set up his entrenchments in this area. Um, could be wrong, though. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I could do that and just kind of wait it out. I doubt Thomas would come through. I mean, he can't come. Th I mean, both sides would just be waiting there through winter. Um so it wouldn't be until December 13th, turn 21, before uh, we get an attack. So maybe what I'll do is quickly play through the next seven turns, since there's not going to be any attacks. Um, there's not going to be anything really. It's just going to be a lot of fatigue management and moving. So maybe I'll bring you back at the end of it. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. I'll let you know. Uh, what I decide on, um, but I think probably that'll be this. Um, yeah, so I, I, anyway, I'll decide what I'm going to do and I'll let you know. Either going to cut the campaign short here and do a different um, campaign, or I'll hurry it through so that we can get to turn 21 and the big battle that we've been waiting for with Thomas. I'll let you know. All right, of course, so I just kept playing. So turn 14, December 6, went really quickly because the Union got one activation. Stanley's four core moved up into the Nashville defenses. Um, but then the very next die roll, um, they tied. So because it's winter, that's the end of the turn. Um, I'll go ahead and get ready on the next turn and we'll keep this moving. We're just motoring right along here on uh, turn 15, December 7th. Um, First die roll of the initiative phase, double twos, turnover. So that's that. The uh, random event I should mention was army initiative change. So uh, army initiative is now neutral, but uh, cleanup has been very easy. Nobody's fatigued. So uh, yeah, we're just motoring right along. We're gonna go into turn 16, December 8th. All right, turn 16, December 8th time. Uh, Confederate's got a couple activations with bait. He just kind of slogging around and, well, in the middle of nowhere. Don't tell him. Uh, Jackson's division got moved up to a creek. I don't know what creek this is. Just a creek. I'm sure the name of it's buried under Wilson or something. Um, but yeah, and then double fives, so turned over. Um, oh, and the random event for this turn was Lions Kentucky Raid which would have been great about 10 turns ago, but now since the Union Cavalry's reinforcements are all on the map, all that happens is Lion's Brigade gets removed from Confederate reinforcements later on. So he's gone to Kentucky and won't be available for a uh, reinforcements later. So that's the end of that turn. I'm even turn 17, December 9th. At the end of December 9th, Turn 17, I think I'm starting to lose track. Um, the Confederates got pretty much all the uh, activations, I think, before the double fives. It's funny, I never really thought about how many times there's been doubles until now. 
Um, so anyway, Buford's Calvary got came up from Holtz Knob up to here. He's going to try to get up on the west side of Schofield. Um, Cheatham's division, uh, core, sorry, with Claiborne and John's, Brown's division. Uh, they moved. I, I don't know what I'm doing with them yet, but I felt like something had to be happen, had to happen. So I think I'm going to bring them down to the Murfreesboro Pike and maybe put pressure on Mill Creek, put pressure on Steedman if he can't get it out of the way. Um, I don't know. We'll see what happens with that. Anyway, that's the end of December 9th. We'll move into December 10th. Only three more turns of winter, and then we're going to be back in the action. And if Schofield can't get out of here, I mean, we still might have that battle after all out front of Brent, outside of Brentwood. Anyway, that's December 9th on the December 10th. So for the random event, we got uh, winter weather end change. So we had to roll a die on a die roll. That's I, the last turn of winter markers move one box ahead, so a day later, and on evens it's moved earlier. So basically, what happened was the we sorry, we rolled an eight. So the last turn of winter went from the twelfth to the eleventh, and since we're on the tenth, that means only two more turns of winter. So hopefully, Schofield and the boys get some activations, and they can get to Nashville or at least closer. I mean, right now they're still strung out on a line and they're still surrounded. So. Um, Hood is hoping that we get some doubles, get these turns over with, so December 12th comes and we can do some attacking. Alright, so December 10th, turn 18. Didn't have very many activations, I think just two, but they were two good ones that counted for the Union. Um, so Schofield, who's Force 1 marker, I'll show you his Force. Uh, he's got Cox, Ruger, Wagner, and then the 175th Ohio. So, obviously he started here at the Toll House. He rolled a 1 on his first activation, which because of the winter weather, like, double, you know, it costs one and a half movement points to go on the uh, pike and to get out of the zone of controls, costs another one, but there's a rule that lets you, it's minimum one movement, uh, you're always allowed to move no matter what. Um, so he moved Force 1 into the hex that has Johnson, uh, Johnson's division, which is really only one dismounted brigade, I think, at this point. Um, but he then got the next activation and was able to move them one more hex because he rolled another one for his movement. So the force just moved once more on the uh, pike. So uh, it's kind of just a cool little, you think about it kind of in a role-playing sense of what, it, what that march would have been like in the winter weather through the snow, Schofield with his big beard, getting his men to go on the march past Fars Cavalry, past Walthall's division, which really couldn't do much because of the winter weather. Um, they could just, maybe they woke up one morning and found the Union camps deserted. Anyway, I think that's kind of cool to think about how that would have happened. Um, so Schofield got out of the trap. Now Hood is left holding the bag and it's going to have to think of something else to do. Maybe I mean, there's still a chance on the next turn to get a couple activations before um, winter weather ends to get up in the face of uh, Schofield, but uh, we'll see. Anyway, that's the end of turn 18. It's December 10th, going into December 11th, the last turn of winter. All right, we're going to have a little skirmish here, it looks like. So the Confederates got the first activation on turn 19. Uh, Stewart sent Loring's division down the pike. Uh, this is Lowe's brigade of cavalry under here. Can I show? Yep, there it is. So they're dismounted because of the Union refit thing. So they can't do a cavalry retreat. So Loring's going to do a uh, attack on the march, just a normal attack. Um, and it's a seven to one manpower ratio for. Uh, plus six, but then minus two for the uh, winter weather modifier is a four, and then uh, Loring's tactical advantage is a plus one, so if my math's right, it's a plus five for the Confederates. I'll go ahead and I'll show you the roll this time. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of that's how it goes. 
Um, when the union need to roll well, they roll well. So six to six uh, on the seven. The Loring loses a manpower and is disorganized, and um, the cavalry just becomes disorganized. So uh, I have not had good luck on the attacks. That's really embarrassing. I'll kind of just fix that up and uh, get back to it. All right, end of turn 19, December 11th, 1864. Um, got a, a lot of good activations for the Union. So Schofield, his force was here. He got a good roll of a six, plus the one was a seven move point. So he was able to get uh, the 175th Ohio and Ruger's division back to here. Um, Wagner's division got into the defenses, but then uh, Schofield and Cox's division are still kind of out here. Um, they didn't have enough movement to get into Wagner's hex, but I think they're safe. Um, Union Cavalry is still going to be kind of sacrificial lambs to be picked off by the, uh, now that they're all unmounted basically. Um, they can't do cavalry retreats, so they're just like infantry. And I think Hood, well, I say that, but you'd think Hood would be able to collect some um, manpower or victory points by uh, defeating some of those units. Uh, Cheatham's Corps uh, is down here in Antioch. So at the end of, so next turn, they're going to be able to burn that railroad station. And yeah, uh, that's kind of it. <laughs> Tennessee Insane Asylum, that's fun. Anyway, uh, so that's the situation at the end of winter. I want to call the uh, episode a close here. I have no idea how long these episodes are until I get into edit them. So if this one's really short, I apologize. Or if it's really long, I also apologize. Anyway, hope you're enjoying the playthrough. And I'll see you next time for turn 20, December 12th. Take care. Bye-bye.